So, ladies and gentlemen, warmly welcome to this breakfast um, uh, event. It's our first hybrid event, and we're so pleased to be at Kamiegi's beautiful offices where we were blended by sunshine just a second ago, or even a minute ago, maybe. Um, and it's such a pleasure to see some of you at least in person. I mean, it's more than just a pleasure. <laughs> it's so lovely to have you all here. And it's also fantastically lovely to have everyone digitally as well, of course. So this spring we have done, or if the spring, since the spring, I should say, we have done only digital events. And we're very pleased to have your support on that and continuing like this to, to support our members um, and your businesses in the best way possible that we can do. So with that, uh, as you know, we've done a lot of focus on how to help you, how to recover, where the economy is going uh, with the financial forecasting. We have um, now started looking at restarting the economy, living with the virus. How do we uh, continue from here? But now it's um, we want to go forward. That's where we, we are today. And uh, with that, we have the American election coming up. But today, of course, and which is eminent to, to the British Swedish Chamber of Commerce and our business community is, of course, the EU exit um, from um, or the, the Britain's exit from the EU. So um, that is why we're here mainly today. And before I move over to what we're going to be talking about today, as we still have this as a digital uh, a hybrid platform, I would like to just mention that the housekeeping rules, as usual, please keep yourself on mute if you're on the digital platform and around the table, please don't just shout out. Well, you can if you, if you have something really important to say, um, I suppose. Um, and uh, But we will unmute you if you have something uh, that you would like to ask. We want this session to be um, interactive. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and write your question and we will let you in eventually. Uh, and this session will be recorded um, for future reference and we will operate under Chatham House rules as we usually do. So please be open and sharing. So today um, it's good timing, it feels like, even though we don't know where these negotiations will bring us. But uh, today we have two experts here at Carnegie, and we're very pleased to, to be hosted by Carnegie Private Banking. And um, we are uh, very pleased to have with us global strategist from Carnegie, Henrik von Sydow. Um, and also our, I would like to say, in-house expert that we have drawn upon all the time, um, Erik Lagerlöf, who's senior associate at Advokatfirman Vinge, uh, <clears throat> who will share um, their insights into where we are today and where we're going. And uh, first off, Henrik von Sydow, who will discuss the political dynamics of the negotiations and also its effects. I think the floor is yours, Henrik. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Christina. Uh, good morning. Uh, most welcome to Canadian Private Banking in the very heart of Stockholm Financial District. Every day at uh, Carnegie, we think on uh, three questions. Uh, what happens in the world? Uh, what kind of future can we believe in? And of course, what should we, uh, should we invest in? Uh, I work as a global strategist. Uh, I'm basically a lawyer. Uh, I've been working as a journalist at Dagens Industri former member of parliament. Now I'm the, the keeping track on, on global events that in the short term uh, affect financial markets and in the long perspective shapes the macro environment and, and the investment landscape. Uh, the post-Brexit negotiation on the future economic relation 
uh, is one of these uh, processes. I'm regularly trying to compare notes with people that are close to or at least familiar with negotiation in both Brussels, London and other capitals in Europe. I will give you uh, just a short uh, uh, brief update on the state of play on tentative timeline ahead, the driving dynamics right now, and, the, and of course then the possible landing zone and the base case scenario as, as well. Uh, there are also investors' insights that I would like to share if there's an uh, opportunity for it. But maybe with, with the state of play, obviously it's very timely, very timely breakfast. There's a European summit today, European Council meeting today, sorry for lunch time, very, very clearly, uh, very formally now elevating uh, the negotiations to a political level. During October, uh, we have had and we have seen a much more uh, intense uh, negotiation process. That means it involves fewer uh, officials from both sides in a more restricted format. There are not caravans of people in, in, in involved anymore. That's a, that's a big change, actually. We have seen the chief uh, negotiators, both Frost and Barnier, had breakfast meeting one on one. And adding to that, there have been a, a series of high level contacts during October, virtually meeting and phone calls between Boris Johnson, between Macron, Merkel, and Ursula von der Leyen. And these things are obviously signing that things are moving in substance in, in the negotiations. Otherwise, they would not have uh, been, been actually talking to each other in that sense. Having that said, uh, 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 no matter what Boris Johnson had said earlier this autumn, there will almost certainly not be a deal uh, at this week's European Council. Uh, there are still substantial gaps uh, on key questions as state aid, fish governance. The EU summit today is uh, more a, of a stepping stone uh, towards a deal during uh, later on, and, and even a new trade agreement. In, in, in this key question on the on the council meeting today uh, is very much based on how the negotiation and how the talks has evolved in, in this, this restricted format. Uh, the EU side will need to uh, weigh. Uh, whether a sufficient level of trust and confidence has been built up uh, that allows the leader uh, um, to believe that a deal uh, can, can be done. Uh, and again, even in the most optimistic scenario, uh, a political deal or a deal in principle uh, today or tomorrow is, is unlikely. Um, but again, the, the member states will come to Brussels uh, with the hope to hear that the landing zone is in reach that they can give their blessing to, to uh, Michel Barnier to, to wrap, things, uh, wrap things up. If it's not so, it's likely that the message from uh, von der Leyen uh, and also Barnier will be that now it's time to continue to ramp up the no deal contingency plan. Um, uh, but also in this case, leaders are unlikely to, to, uh, to end the negotiation uh, during this uh, summit. So it's important insight about today. It's not a break it or make it event, uh, but it will probably provide a lot of uh, a very substantial orientation for investor markets and, and, and companies. So there's a lot of things to watch. Uh, since the council is not a break it or make it event, uh, uh, markets are still in, in seeking clarity about the tentative timeline ahead. What's the process that will follow given that we are very close to, to the end of the transition period, the 31st of December. According to draft, and not official, officially the uh, timetable in Brussels, the council meeting are thought to be followed by a tunnel, it's referred to often in, when it comes to negotiation technique, as a tunnel, which is a process where the two sides will enter to hammer out a joint legal text. There is a cut of date for a deal on legal text at the end of October. As after that, there will be ratification steps that the EU size will, will have to go through that are very hard to change. The, the ratification process are, as it's sometimes referred to as, in, incompressible. So uh, important to keep in mind that at the end of October, the 31st of October, someone are referred to as the actual date, that there has to be a, a, a clear um, uh, deal on a legal on a legal text. Assuming that there is a completed legal text uh, um, that comes together by the negotiator no later than 31st October, uh, uh, the draft then have to be shared, of course, with EU capitals and also with the European Parliament. Uh, the the draft agreement would then, of course, have to be revised by by lawyer. It has to be translated. You know, as you know, it's a heavily um, 
a massive process in, in that sense. It's um, uh, very likely, of course, that the member states will take some time to study and comment on the text. Uh, the council will then have to approve this deal, uh, likely by a written procedure uh, or perhaps uh, another formal meeting, if it's possible to have it during the circumstances in Europe. It might be a, a written procedure that might be the, the most convenient way in this. According to the draft EU timetable, the European Parliament would then provide a principal sign-off uh, on their session the 23rd to 26th November with a formal consent vote on the 14th to 17th December. Note the dates, we're very close to the end of the transition, transition periods. If you have just a brief update on the driving dynamics, um, uh, obviously the trend during October, October was a much better month than September for sure. They are very much, both EU, UK and EU are inching towards an agreement on a zero tariff, zero quota trade deal, although there are a, still a lot to do before a deal finally comes together. So substantial gaps still remain, and you know, probably know the issues, but that's uh, what people are pointing on, state aid, fish, and, and, and governments as well for this. When you raise the negotiation to a political level, a key question for both sides, um, is uh, will, will a deal be able to be sold? Can it be sold? The question is very much if a political deal is, is political saleable and what political risks are Johnson, Boris Johnson and other EU leaders, notably Macron, notably on fish, willing to actually entertain? Both London and Paris need a win on fish. And you might think this is a little bit bizarre. There's a lot of economic at stake and it's very much uh, came down to, to fish. Then just remember that the treaties between Norway, Iceland and European Union has failed because of discussion, discussion fishing rights. It's um, um, the, the French president Emmanuel Macron now pressed by the situation in France, uh, perhaps will find it easier to actually blame uh, the Brits for no deal then win over fishing community to, to a compromise that, that actually hurts their interest. On the other hand, you can also, of course, question Macron if he would be willing to let the fishing community in France lose all their access to, to the uh, UK waters. That would be the case, actually, in, in a no deal. Uh, note also that there is a German presidency uh, at the European Council, uh, which makes Angela Merkel, of course, as a key player for a compromise. Merkel is well known for being slow, she is waiting for before uh, presenting a compromise proposal, perhaps gradually phasing out fishing rights uh, and regularly every, uh, every year overview a possible phasing out of, of, on the fishing rights. And here you actually got, uh, if you're looking for a landing zone on this, that might be the possible landing zone to, to actually go for, for in reach. Uh, speaking about dynamic, um, I said whether we can notice that there's been high speed in the negotiation. Still, we know very little what the actual trade agreement will be about. And that's actually a positive sign. In this discussion, in this negotiation, you really have to, you know, uh, looking for, listen for the sound of silence. That means things actually, the deals actually are being done. That means that negotiators actually are building trust to each other, not uh, dealing information to the media to make headlines or newspapers. So looking for the sound of silence, that's actually a good thing. There will be a lot of political theater today or tomorrow. That's part of the game. That will make some headlines, of, of course. But what you should really be looking for and, 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 and um, uh, listen to is uh, the negotiated Frost and, and Barnier at these stage. So the timeline uh, that I presented and laid out, uh, um, that's, um, uh, that's a tentative timeline. Uh, that's also the best case scenario that we now can look for. That's the best case scenario. That is also uh, my base case scenario. I would say it's a probability of 60% that we can reach a deal at the end of November and, and definitely sign at the end of December, 60%. But given uh, the gaps uh, that we, we, we pointed to, 
given the very stressed procedure, there's obviously a lot of things that still could go wrong, which makes 40% uh, a probability to a new deal. 40%, that's a very high probability. I've been following the Brexit process since 2016. I would say I've never had a higher probability for a no deal outcome. Still, it's not the base case. That's too much uh, at stake. That's too much risk for decision maker. They will do uh, almost whatever it takes to land uh, on a deal or give the negotiation more time ahead. Um, partly due to because it's very hard to, to predict and overview the consequences, what, what will actually go to happen with the economy. You've never done that thing, uh, thing and go, go to overnight leaving a trading bloc like the European, like the European Union. But also note again at the timeline, if you are, want to look where the risks are, they will be very close to the end of the transition period. Actually pointing to that um, if there is a no deal, it will be delivered very late uh, in the process with little time to, to prepare. Actually, that's a key uh, question that uh, we frequently get. Many questions about from investors and also companies, what kind of trade regime uh, will be uh, in place and taking effect on uh, January the, the, the 1st? All these questions will have their answers very late this year. So clarity will come at a very, uh, very late uh, stage. And again, Brexit is not in the headlines anymore. There are other things to discuss. Christina mentioned some of them. Trump, the pandemic, even more now than uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's not on the headlines. It's not very much a major uh, factor on financial markets, except for the sterling that is obviously affected, also the Swedish crown now. Uh, but I would say that there are turbulence uh, week coming up. November might be very messy. Uh, if you look at all these different processes coming up, both the European election, both the pandemic situation, and then add, add, add Brexit as a factor to it. So the last quarter of the year, uh, the Brexit risk premium probably will return uh, to both UK and European markets. That was 10 minutes. I'm, of course, very happy to, to discuss what will likely be the most turbulent week coming up. Thank you much. Thank you very much. Should we directly move on to... And uh, keep, keep the questions for, for after for both speakers. So, Erik Lagerlöf from Vinje, the floor is yours. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, may I start with saying thank you to the organizers and hosts of this event, BSSC, and also Carnegie, of course. Uh, my name is Erik Lagerlöf. I'm a, a lawyer at the law firm Vinje. I am by training a barrister. I'm still attached to my former university, Cambridge, and I'm very much an Anglophile. Um, I will, or the point of this presentation is to give a sort of a, a bird's eye view of the legal consequences, implications of, of Brexit. But by doing so, in doing so, I will of course also comment on, on, the, uh, on the ongoing uh, negotiations. May I start with uh, reminding you that the Brexit uh, process was meant to be conducted in three stages. The first stage, the first part of this procedure was the exit itself, the withdrawal. Uh, and of course, as you know, the UK left the European Union on the 31st of January of this year. Uh, come 1st of February, it is no longer a member state. And that is important. It is also important then to recognize that there is actually an agreement between the parties to consider. There is uh, a withdrawal agreement uh, formed between the EU and the UK. This agreement uh, is of importance for business in particular, if you are concerned with say, the import and export of goods. Um, this agreement is also important uh, because it contains important provisions on what will happen with intellectual property rights. It has important provisions on VAT. It has uh, important provisions on ongoing procedures related to customs, for example, and also uh, public procurement uh, uh, processes. And when I say ongoing, I mean ongoing, ongoing at the time of the end of the transition period. That is the period that we now find ourselves in. 
And of course, the transition period is, sta is stage two in the Brexit procedure. Uh, the purpose of this stage two, the transition period, was to have a smooth transitioning between uh, the UK as a member state of the European Union and a new formal arrangement, arrangement between the EU and the UK. What is so essential about the transition period is that EU law continues to be applicable to and within the United Kingdom. That means for business purposes, for commercial purposes, that uh, things are as they were before the UK left the European Union. The same rules apply now as they did before when the UK was a member state of the EU. Um, and what is so essential about this is of course that when the transition period ends, come 1st of January of next year, probably, because I don't think there will be an extension of the transition period, although that is a possible uh, 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 outcome, of course, but the, what is so essential about this is that 1st of January of next year is the first point, first point in time when the consequences of Brexit, Brexit will actually be felt. Uh, for, most, for most businesses, Brexit hasn't really happened yet. That happens on 1st of January of next year. So all those consequences that you may have heard about, read about, or fear, dreaded, those have not yet happened. And that is key and essential. And this is also why it is so important uh, that we now, uh, that we will have, or, or uh, we hope to have, an agreement between the parties concerning future relations. Um, one more point on the transition period and, and this change that comes into effect on the 1st of January, this is my view of, of the preparations so far is that they are completely insufficient and inadequate, uh, certainly in this country. And there is a, a uh, sadly a lack of focus on Brexit now for understandable reasons because we have this awful pandemic going on. Uh, but it's clear that in my view, uh, Swedish companies, but also British companies have not prepared sufficiently for what is going to happen on 1st of January. And now we move on to future relations and the negotiations between, between the parties. And I will not say much uh, uh, about those, uh, Henrik did uh, so splendidly. What I will say though, is of course, that on trust, which Henrik mentioned, so important in negotiations, the level of trust is very, very low uh, between the parties. Uh, it, it didn't help that the UK came out and, 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 and a minister of the UK government stressed that they will breach international law, that is, that, or there is a possibility that they will breach international law if the negotiations don't end up where the UK wants them to. Uh, and that has not helped uh, 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 trust between the parties. On fish, what is interesting perhaps that the UK recently struck a deal with, with Norway on fish. There is a precedent, and uh, I would say a rather sensible precedent uh, uh, set by, by Norway and the UK in this regard. Um, on future relations and what we can expect from a new, uh, a new arrangement between the parties, um, what is important to bear in mind is, of course, that formal negotiations or concerning future relations did not begin until the first or until February of this year. So the parties has, have, in effect, only negotiated for eight or nine months. Uh, that is, is quite extreme. Normally, it takes five to ten years for, for parties, certainly if you negotiate with the European Union, um, and to, to strike a, a free trade agreement. Of course, one could argue that the parties at this point, uh, uh, this time around, uh, come from very different starting positions with the EU, sorry, with the UK having been a, a member state. But what is clear is that there has been, and still is of course, extreme time pressure on the parties. And now uh, we're only uh, two and a half months or so, uh, uh, until the two and a half months until the end of the transition period. And of course, the time pressure hasn't, hasn't uh, been reduced. So I think it is safe to say that whatever agreement is, is formed, and I still think that there will be an agreement between the parties, it will not be an ambitious, broad, deep and flexible partnership as was advertised by both parties, in particular perhaps by the UK government in the run up to, to, uh, to Brexit. Oh, sorry, by the, by the Leave voters or the, uh, those advocating uh, the Leave position before Brexit. Um, what is so also important in, in, in this context, and that Henrik stressed this, is of course ratification and implementation. 
if there is an agreement uh, which only requires the ratification of the EU and not the other member states, that such a ratification procedure may be formalized and may be done before New Year's. If the member states are involved, and this is often the case when the EU uh, negotiates free trade agreements, if it is a so-called mixed agreement, meaning that also the member states will have to sign this in their own right, uh, which also uh, indicates there will be a broader agreement between the parties. If that happens, of course, there will have to be an approvement, uh, approval procedure in all the national parliaments throughout the member states. Uh, I find it uh, very difficult to believe that such a procedure involving so many parliaments will be able uh, to be concluded uh, prior to, to the new year. Um, I also believe, as Hendrik mentioned, that the no deal uh, scenario is certainly still a distinct possibility. What, what happens then? Well, uh, uh, we fall back on WTO rules to some extent, and uh, we also fall back on domestic law, EU law, national, uh, member state law, and also UK law. Um, I will not say much about that, but I, I will only stress that the difference, say, between the WTO legal framework and the EU legal framework is enormous. Um, and things will not be the same if we fall back on the WTO rules. Um, <clears throat> what then can be expected from a future agreement? Uh, well, I think it will be focused on goods in particular. Uh, I think the parties will come to an agreement where they will agree on no tariffs, no quantity restrictions. That's quite common. I think that's quite feasible. However, there will be no uh, regulatory, uh, uh, common regulatory framework in place, meaning that the regulatory requirements that the UK and the EU, uh, and the EU uh, respectively have will be different. That means in terms, of course, also uh, that you will have to take into consideration uh, that there will be border checks between any uh, export imports of goods between the parties. So uh, even if there are no tariffs, no quantitative restrictions, there will certainly be border checks. That of, that of course have consequences for companies importing and exporting goods because it will take longer, it will be more complicated, it will be more, be more bureaucratic and it will be more costly. On services, I think the agreement will be limited. Most, or I would say all uh, large free trade agreements uh, uh, excluding uh, the, EU, uh, uh, the EU agreements, um, are limited when it comes to services. One example concerning financial services, for example, at the moment, we have a so-called passport system. If you're giving a passport in one member state, that means you can offer your services to throughout the EU in all the member states without difficulties. That is, will no longer be a possibility uh, uh, as we move forward. And I don't think a free trade agreement between the EU and the UK will change that. Um, we hope that there may be other uh, provisions, possibly, hopefully, uh, uh, dealing with, for example, which is very important, data transfers between the EU and the UK. Uh, I, I suspect that this will become more complicated, or there is a risk for complications when you transfer data between the EU and the UK. That is a massive issue in itself. Uh, you will have heard the, the abbreviation GDPR before. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a, a, a legal framework that will be of massive importance as we move forward. And as you, some of you may know, uh, the Court of Justice in Luxembourg have made the situation more difficult uh, during the last few months with, with, a, with a, a judgment that complicates, complicates matters. Mm -hmm. uh, one issue that I, as a lawyer, uh, would like to stress, of course, uh, is that the lack of individual rights in the uh, agreements. What I mean by that is that if a company has an issue with, for example, a national law that is not comply in compliance with a, a future agreement between the EU and the UK, there will be no possibility to go to, to, go to a court and, and rely directly on the new uh, free trade agreement. That is a possibility now. You can go to a Swedish court, you can go to a UK court and rely directly on, the e on EU law uh, before that court. That would no longer be a possibility. And I think that for companies would be a massive, massive negative uh, uh, drawback. I will end with some, a, few reflect, a few reflections on, 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 on what is currently taking place between the EU and the UK. I think the loss of the UK uh, to, for the EU is, a, is, a, is an enormous loss. I think the British have stood for free trade, a very important uh, aspect in, in, in the Swedish context in a Swedish perspective. I think, I think the British have stood for common sense within the EU. I think the British have stood for excellence 
within the British within the EU institutions. Without uh, uh, British uh, uh, civil servants in the institutions, I, I think the, uh, the EU will be worse off for it. Um, I also think that the EU without the UK will have significant, significant consequences for Sweden and Sweden's place in the EU and in Europe. I think we have seen this effect already. Uh, and one prominent example is, of course, the uh, COVID, uh, sorry, the Corona crisis uh, package that was negotiated between the member states. Of course, a package that was opposed by the Swedish government. In the end, the Swedish government had to a large extent give in. I don't think the outcome of those negoti negotiations would have been the same if the UK would have, been, would have sat around the table. So we already see the political effects of the UK missing at the negotiating te table uh, where, the, now the, where the member states of the Europeans, European Union sit. Also, I think there will be a shift in, 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 uh, in power within the EU towards the southeast. Certainly Germany and France will, of course, they already, or they already were, they will sort of be so in the future, the key players. But the UK will be out of the picture. There will no longer be a triangle. There will no, be, no longer be a London, Paris, Berlin hotline. It will be Paris, Berlin, and also it will be a shift southeast and a, a more focus on, 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 on the Mediterranean uh, countries, I think. I think it is important, vital, that Sweden, but also not only in a public uh, perspective, but also in a private perspective, that companies uh, make the most of the situation, that they are well equipped to handle EU law and how Sweden and EU regulations are dealt with within the EU framework. I think that would require uh, that requires a rather steep learning curve. So far, uh, we haven't been very good at dealing with EU law, EU regulations, EU perspective in Sweden, from my perspective. What will happen on the 1st of January? I don't think there will be a crash. Uh, I don't think there will be any, a crash anytime soon. I think, however, that there is, there is a risk of a downhill slope, uh, that uh, if we don't act and, for example, become better, uh, dealing with um, our, our friends within, within the EU. I think that this project, the European Union, uh, there is a possibility or there's a risk of, of, it going, of it going downhill. What about the UK? I think the UK in the end, in the long term, will pull through. Um, I am a strong believer in the United Kingdom. Uh, and I think all, despite the current turmoil, I believe that the UK will manage in the long term uh, to, 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 to uh, settle into a life outside. The European Union. Thank you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Eric. And um, um, we would like to see if there are any questions. So, please, if you're with us uh, on Zoom, please do write your questions and we will let you um, come in if you like. But first, we are keeping social distancing here in the room and we have uh, 10 guests around the table that we would like to start with. Um, so Gabriella from Lloyds, please. Um, yeah, I have my first question is directed to you, Henry. You mentioned fish and that is obviously a huge, huge issue in this. Uh, could you quickly just touch on the Ireland issue? Uh, it would be very interesting to hear where if that has landed anywhere, or if that is, uh, there is still the Irish issue is uh, still an issue with uh, a lot of lack of details. Um, and it, it has been connected to this internal market bill that the European, uh, the UK government presented in, in in September. That actually was the trigger for for Boris Johnson government to to uh, make that proposal. Uh, I have no um, uh, notes that, that the uh, Irish issue has been an issue otherwise, other than connected to the internal market bill in the UK uh, during the negotiation this time. But for sure, and that's a, actually a general point of view, there are so many highly complicated issues that are now being negotiated in a high speed. So uh, again, it's, it's a lack of detail. It is going to be very difficult to see. I would say that we can count on uh, when it comes to an implementation phase, phase that the question of the Irish border will, will get back as a negotiation part. May I weigh course. in on that? Um, I, I think so far we don't know how it will practically, the solution that was agreed on between the parties, we still don't know how the UK intends to handle that uh, practically. 
So, so far, there is no practical solution to an agreement that was formed between, between the parties. And I think that's the key. E the EU has stressed and asked for a reassurance uh, that the UK will be able to manage the border, but so far that such re reassurance hasn't, hasn't been, been put forward. Um, so we had uh, Liz Gerd from Brexit Product. <clears throat> Thank you very much for a very interesting presentations. Uh, I have a question uh, concerning trust. Um, I talked uh, with a Swedish diplomat in Brussels uh, the other day, and he said that uh, there is a lack of trust from the EU side because um, they had the question of internal market deal, uh, internal market bill, uh, and the UK has uh, withdrawn from the withdrawal agreement, so to say. Uh, what is your uh, perspective on, on this uh, topic? Can the trust be, uh, can you increase the trust between the parties and uh, what, what effect will this internal market bill have to the trust between the parties? Well, I, I think it has had already a <coughs> devastating effect on trust between the parties. And I don't think the trust will, will uh, I mean, the level of trust between the parties was very low uh, before uh, the internal market was presented. Uh, I think it is, is, uh, is an issue of massive importance that a UK minister stands in parliament and uh, acknowledges that the UK will intentionally breach international law. Um, I'm not sure I have heard that before. Um, and so that has, of course, not got, gone down very well. And I think that will have severe consequences also going forward, because, of course, the negotiations will not end with whatever happens during the next few weeks. The negotiations concerning future relations will be ongoing for years to come. Uh, and I think trust will be a significant issue at that point. Um, one could compare with the position taken by Margaret Thatcher in the early 90s, uh, that on, on European issues that didn't go down well with uh, in, in other member states uh, and that has had a significant impact on trust and also on the UK position within the EU at that point during the 1990s. Um, so I think uh, trust, the tr level of trust is, is very low, the internal market level has certainly not helped the level of trust and I think uh, 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 the lack of trust was, is an issue that we will have to uh, consider for, for, for some time to come. Yeah, I would add that if you if you try to range it the level of trust in september will probably at an all-time low uh, mm -hmm. between the two parts um, as i referred to there have been some contacts and some phone calls uh, signalizing that things are moving in substance uh, and how they speed up and recover from the crisis is in september is um, you you might question it if this is london spin from the boris johnson government that we are actually a bit too positive uh, when it comes to regarding the dynamics in the negotiation due to spin from London. Mm -hmm. uh, you, if you compare notes, it's a more positive signals from London coming up right now, perhaps depending on the Boris Johnson and, and, and his advisors have, has decided that we should actually go for a deal, we have to make a uh, positive sentiment during the negotiations. If you compare to Brussels, who actually are more uh, more negative. If I ha if it was the same signal from officials in in Brussels as there are from from London, then it would be 65 and 70 percent for the. But still, uh, uh, advice uh, Barnier and his comments and also uh, signals from the institution are more uh, skeptical on the advance of the negotiations. Mm -hmm. So so it, it would be a. Uh, again, my base case is a deal, uh, uh, but that's a, quite a comeback uh, if you regard the level of trust as at all time low in, in September. Yeah. So, Philip from Handelsbanken. Henry, given your political background, what influence, if any, do you think Sweden can play in the end game? Uh, I think we can. Um, um, we can make uh, more impact than uh, actually what kind of size we actually have in, when it comes to economy. Since we, we could have connections with uh, the UK, we could be a, a bridge builder. We could, uh, uh, it's a key word here. Uh, I'm not really seeing Sweden as a key actor in this process. Key actor, again, as were the names that I mentioned. This is very much about Boris Johnson, Macron, Merkel. Uh, von der Leyen uh, is the first pro. Um, um, no, um, I, I, I don't see Sweden as a key player in this. Eric. 
Well, I think the only thing to say, though, I mentioned the poor outcome uh, concerning the Corona crisis package negotiations. But uh, on the upside, uh, from, from my understanding, this was the probably one of the first times when Sweden actually raised its voice uh, and made its voice heard uh, in, in, in a significant fashion. And a lot of people were surprised by that. So hopefully there is a bit of a, a shift going on in the Swedish government realizing that we'll have to be uh, more upfront and also uh, more clearly take an issue or take a side, uh, pick a side uh, in, in negotiation, negotiations to come. So hopefully Sweden will be able to at least play a larger part than they have uh, done so far. You have to look for new alliances in the European uh, Union in that sense. A more Nordic cooperation with Sweden, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Ireland perhaps, um, uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, Baltic countries, sometimes referring as, as the new uh, the Hansa 2.0, 2.0, uh, the new Hansa, that um, that kind of nice has to be um, effective. They lost when it came to the uh, uh, Corona uh, found in, in, this, in this situation. So what is, um, you said that November, Henry, could be very messy. So what is your view on uh, the end of the year and the beginning of first quarter of next year from a market's point of view, obviously depending on what's happening right now, but what is the outlook right now? Eric mentioned one thing that is uh, central in this, that, you know, is that the Brexit has not materialized mm -hmm. yet. Brexit has not materialized yet. We will, even if you get a deal, again, very forced process, very stressed process, mm -hmm. Um, uh, how will it be implemented? Uh, we test it mm. in January, in that sense. Um, that, that that would be uh, one thing to watch, of course. But again, I think that the market turbulence is more in uh, market turbulence. You might it's a little bit of drama here, mm -hmm, of <laughs> but the, the, uh, Brexit as a factor, Brexit negotiations as as a factor, uh, more likely in November uh, than when uh, than after you have a uh, have a deal if you have it. Mm. Um, if there is a no deal, if no deal comes comes late in November or even in December, or in the most dramatic scenario that the European Union don't vote for mm. uh, for a deal, uh, then uh, you can see the same kind of market reaction as you did um, during the referendum. Mm. Uh, dramatic fall, and then how you actually respond to it will matter uh, how uh, we recover. Mm. So um, Henrik mentioned his views on uh, um, how likely it is, uh, the base scenario and uh, um, others. So Erik, what is your prediction? My prediction is that I, well, I agree with Henrik. I think it is more likely than not that an agreement will be formed between the parties. Uh, it would be quite extraordinary for fish fisheries to, to be uh, the cause for, 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 for the negotiations to, be, to break down. I don't think that will happen. Uh, I think that has been a climb down, or there has been a climb down from the UK concerning the level playing field uh, issue, which was perhaps the most important, most difficult stumbling block between mm. the negotiations. Mm. So I th th certainly think that the, uh, the uh, I, I, my prediction is that there will be an agreement, but uh, then the question comes, what, what kind of an agreement is it? Mm. Uh, and I don't, uh, my hopes are not uh, enormous uh, in that regard. And the agreement that will be negotiated and signed, hopefully before the end of the year, can be developed. Yes, of course. I think um, this is not the uh, this is not the end. No. So, <laughs> perhaps uh, to, to to create a favourite of mine, this may be the end of the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and but uh, uh, it is not the beginning of the end. Um, so I think. Uh, uh, the negotiations will continue for years to come. Mm -hmm. That's a very uh, dramatic sentence Eric mentioned now. Uh, uh, the negotiation will continue years uh, on. Uh, get used to it, in a sense. Um, and that's, that's my, uh, my, my view as well. If you look at the Brexit negotiations to a, uh, to a broad uh, free trade agreement as, as one meter, where are we? If this is one meter negotiation, well, uh, even, it, of course, depending on what's the substance of the, the, the agreement, we're not even 50 centimeters, 60 centimeters. So there are plenty, plenty more space to, 
Mm. And, but, uh, so however much we would like to continue discussing this today, this early morning, which is turning out to be a sunny one anyway, uh, I think we should end on that positive note, thanking both of you for, for speaking to us this morning. And I think to be continued, thank you very much, Kaniegi, for hosting us. Thank you everyone for attending uh, digitally and for everyone around the table and for your questions. Uh, to be continued, I said, there's another one, another event called Countdown to Exit UK's new trading relationship with the EU, together with the Swedish Chamber of Commerce at 11 today as well. <laughs> so to be right. continued, I look forward to seeing you and speaking to you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.